Rick Perry is a guy who knows where all the bodies are buried in Washington, may have buried one or two of them himself. Mr. Regulation, Rick, what's the, what's the hot topic right now up at the Puzzle Palace? Oh, goodness. Um, well, I think the media has reported pretty well the uh, 147 uh, interim final rule that was published. A uh, long time in the coming, you know. I think I've, I've probably worked on it, uh, pieces of it anyway, for the better part of 30 years. So Jeez. trying to see that Yikes. finally come to fruition is kind of nice. Um, overall, pretty good regulation, uh, performance-based. Looks like the FAA is kind of getting out of their own way on this one. Um, recognizing schools as schools, uh, accreditation, giving benefit for accreditation, stuff like that, and uh, uh, allowing uh, the modernization. So I think overall, uh, I'd give them a pretty good grade for this one. Okay. Um, on the negative side um, of it, um, I'm not thrilled when Congress regulates. Who and, is? Well, and, and that's what happens when you know, you get frustrated with the FAA and so you go to Congress and you, you lobby Congress to, 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 you know, put some pressure on the FAA and then Congress ends up regulating and dictating that you will do a regulation and it will say X, Y, and Z. And then, and, it, and it's not an FAA thing, it's a, no. it's a Congress to executive branch agencies. And the next thing you know is, is that you end up with a regulation where the agency has no more control over it. Um, you know, we see that um, the most obvious and something AEA is not involved with, um, but as aircraft owners, we are, mm -hmm. um, and that's the unleaded fuel. Um, you know, everybody wants to point to EPA and blame EPA for it, but it's not EPA. It is the Clean Air Act, the law, that dictates it. And it's always it's unintended always and secondary consequences unintended consequences of a well-intended idea and the end result is is that uh, you can't work with the agency anymore to solve problems no. and so uh, overall regulation is great the process of doing it I'm not thrilled with I don't doubt it how do how do we fix that is there a way well we AEA generally don't lobby Congress to manage the FAA, okay? Yeah. It's just a, a personal decision. Uh, it's not that we don't support a lot of the things that they're doing, uh, certainly, uh, you know, pressures and stuff, but, uh, um, you know, it's not a pathway we prefer. We prefer the agency's pathway mm -hmm. to manage things. Ouch. So, but that's the hot topic. Um, you know, the, the uh, drone world uh, was pretty thrilled with the uh, Beyond Visual Line of Sight uh, ARC report that came out. Yeah. Um, honestly, no surprises. Um, don't know how far it'll go. Yeah. Um, there's some elements in there that are clearly uh, pro uh, unmanned vehicles, um, un uncrewed vehicles. Um, it, but to the detriment of manned aircraft, um, in some cases. To the challenge of, of staff to crew to aircraft, yes. Um, um, there's elements in there that they have to work out the details of. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I like leveraging the technology that they highlighted as part of the report. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know that the, the, the technology is mature enough to fully do everything it's talking about, but fundamentally, the idea of leveraging technology as we move forward, moving away from 1950s and 60s and 70s um, prescriptive technologies, those things make sense. And uh, so, you know, uh, as always, uh, you know the details are what matters. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see what happens. But this is a this is a, a recommendation. This is an ARC report that goes into the agency, and you never know what the outcome is of those. Um, and I fully expect that the agency will adopt those pieces that make sense. Uh, they will probably reject those pieces that are fundamentally against the Civil Aviation Act. Um, and Oops. but 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 also. Uh, hopeful 
that they can read it with an open eye to the possibilities of technological solutions. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's huge. Well, let me ask you this. We've had a little bit of a curveball thrown at us when Steve Dixon decided that uh, it was time for him to uh, end his helming mm -hmm. of, the, of the agency. Uh, now we've got acting administrators, uh, not one but two technically, mm, and, yeah. and so forth. Uh, is this a hiccup? Is this a, is this a temporary measure? What's, what's going to be happening and what effect does it have on businesses as usual? Um, so, if you remember, uh, what too many years ago where the administrator was renewed at every administration. Mm -hmm. And um, if you go back, and, and I did this when... Prior when, to the five-year term. Prior right. to the five-year term. And the reality was is that part of the reason we went to the five-year term was is because we struggled with... Um, we struggled with uh, the turnover. It took a year or so for the new administration to identify the new administrator. Mm -hmm. So we were only getting two and three years from an administrator anyway. Yeah. Uh, it's, it is the professional staff. Not a, great, not a great way to run an agency. No, no, and that's what, that's what the five-year term was, and it was to bridge the, the politics of the administrations. And, and so, you know, I went back when, when uh, the administrator announced his retirement, and I kind of went back and looked at what the turnover had been of administrators, and honestly, this isn't out of the norm, yeah. okay? And so his announcement of his retirement is fine. It, it makes sense. Okay. Um, if you look at the resume, now, you know, Billy Nolan had just been hired to replace Ali Barami. Phenomenal qualifications. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, his resume is, is unbelievable when you actually go and look at oh, it. Oh, no, it's, it's amazing. And so when he replaced Ali, highly qualified for that job. And, um, and so, honestly, I wasn't surprised to see him fleeted up as the acting administrator, okay? Um, hugely qualified for it. Uh, Aeronautical Society fellow, a um, lot of airline background, a lot of military background. Um, he just he just checks off all the boxes. So I'm very confident with that. I had worked with him when he was with uh, A4A, okay, uh, back in the days Airlines for America, and um, you know, pleasure to work with, and very level-headed and very very solid. So I feel good about that. Um, what you were talking about with the two actings, yeah. um, uh, Brad Mims has been the deputy all along. Yeah. And what I kind of read into the, the press release was is kind of a, a, a co-administrator yeah. rather than really two actings, okay? Which is a bit and of a departure. It is a bit of a departure, but I have to say a logical one. Good. Um, you know, for for... Brad to pick up the management of the of the organization and the infrastructure while Billy takes on the face and the politics, it actually makes sense because the decisions that are made for the infrastructure and the organization are going to be long-term decisions. And so having, you know, Brad Mims' uh, timeline, experience, um, familiarity, with the agency will do nothing but be positive for that. So, okay. I, so I actually support what they're doing. I think it's fantastic. Well, there you go. Well, if, it gets, if it's got the Rick Perry seal of approval. <laughs> <clears throat> they didn't call ahead of time, I'm just saying. Oh, you know, well, that was a mistake. You know. I mean, seriously. Um, one thing I wanted to chat with you about a little bit, because it's been brought up a couple of times. There is the massive rumor, of course, is that we will see significant changes to aircraft certification as a result of the evolution of what was light sport, uh, what's turned into a variety of different names and categories and uh, word salad. And they're talking about giving us guidelines at Oshkosh this year with, mm -hmm. with the potential of a rule year later. Okay. 
where do you see all this going right now? And what are your concerns? Well, you're talking about Mosaic. Yeah. And it's okay to use Mosaic because it's the modernization of special airworthiness certificates. Like I said, word salad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so Mosaic was first introduced um, to address some of the shortcomings of the light sport rule years ago. Upgrade a little bit of the experimental amateur build stuff, the EAB world. And, um, and that was the focus. And then Congress, again, legislatively mandating that uh, the agency address the certification of unmanned drones, unmanned aircraft drones. And also the no, no, AAM. Uncrewed, uncrewed. Uncrewed, whatever uncrewed. the world is these days. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but, but, um, but also the AAM, the Advanced Air Mobility Aircraft, because we've got these new technologies coming about and we're dealing with a legacy certification philosophy. And so Congress basically told the FAA we need to modernize these certification rules. So those elements of it are pretty straightforward. Uh, there's not a lot of surprises at the LSA side of things. And because most of the LSA side is actually going through the LSA ASTM committee, mm -hmm. we're really pretty aware of what the recommendations are from that arena. The rest of it's being done behind the curtain. And that's the part where we just don't, they, they can't share as much because it's active rulemaking. And so we're not getting a lot of information. Now, if they intend to have a public meeting about Mosaic at Oshkosh to where they have a stenographer taking notes and questions and answers are all end up in the Federal Register, that's great, that's fantastic. Um, however, that's the only way they can really talk about that rulemaking. Mm -hmm. And so they're gonna have to have some infrastructure there. There's a couple of elements in the flight standards side of things and we don't know what's coming out in there and that's what keeps me up at night. Um, we know that um, as was pointed out in the BV loss arc rule that um, part 91 doesn't adequately address autonomy. Um, it has human language in it not technology language. And so we know that 91 needs to be upgraded quite a bit. Um, we know that to be effective in a lot of the uh, for on-demand activity, the 135 community, there's a lot of 135 regulations that are, again, human-centric mm -hmm. that have to be updated <laughs> to be able to address this new technology. We know that for the ultra small, under 55 pound aircraft, that an A and P certificate is probably overkill. <laughs> and so, you know, the reality is, is that a UAS repairman is likely to come out of this, mm -hmm. which will be unlike LSA, which is a, a super light personal aircraft, and, and honestly, too light in a number of areas, I think that the UAS repairman will be more product specific. So the amount of training will be commensurate with whichever product you're working on, mm -hmm. which I think is a, is a pretty good approach to this. And it's gonna create a new pathway into aviation, mm -hmm. which is any, anytime we can recruit young people to come into this industry, it's a great thing, right? Amen to that. The area of concern is as we look at this next generation of aircraft, we cannot dismiss a hundred years of air aviation. And kind of hard to ignore it, isn't it? Well, and, and, and as much as we want to be able to embrace technology and embrace a lot of the things that, that are being brought to the table today, which we truly like, we love. At the same time, if a 135 operator gets to leverage 
a low-cost maintenance technician in support of their operations, manned aircraft 135 operations have to be able to take advantage of the same low-cost repairmen. If you're going to discount some of the human requirements in manned 135 operations, or in unmanned 135 operations, you have to be able to discount those same things in manned because otherwise you're giving a competitive advantage to a new aircraft. And that's an unfair advantage business-wise. Mm -hmm. And so these are the things that and we somebody really... somebody could really make a lot of that at some point. Well, and, and you look at EMS with helicopter operations, you look at pipeline patrol, power line patrols, these things that are done today with a, a, a human pilot and a legacy aircraft, the logistical support of those aircraft is pretty significant. And to say, oh, well, we've got this new entrant into the marketplace, so we're going to give this economic advantage to these new aircraft and discount the existing operations. Um, that's just a, it's a competitive unfairness that is not allowed in regulations. And so when these rules come out, we're gonna be watching them very closely and communicating with the membership. I know that uh, NATA, the National Air Transportation Association, is watching it closely in, in defense of their existing 135 operations. I know that the Helicopter Association is watching it, again, to make sure that the, the traditional helicopter operations aren't discounted as we move forward into this new generation. And that's the balance, and it's not an easy balance, but that's the balance the agency has to meet. And so whether we meet the rule by the end of the year or not is really going to be dependent on how they can work out those balances. Hmm. Well, it's certainly interesting to watch the industry churn it all out day after day, uh, especially with two and a half years of abnormal operations, <laughs> shall we say. We're certainly getting back to it in a uh, fairly speedy way. The big question now is uh, how much changed in this last two and a half years, how we get into it from here on out, and now with an industry that's ready to be going and growing again, can we? Yes, yes, and yes. Well, there you go. Um, the last two and a half years have for forced us to use technology. Big time. That industry has been requesting for two decades. And so it has springboarded us into a much more efficient process than we had before the pandemic. And this is worldwide. And so I believe firmly that the next decade is going to benefit from the last two years. Well, we shall see. Rick Perry, I can't tell you how much we appreciate the chance to talk to you. I know you got a hard break and a place to get off to and I do. people to see and hopefully upset. So we'll see what's going on. Sounds Rick good. Perry, uh, AEA's man in Washington, Mr. Regulation, and frankly, the guy we call when we can't get real answers from anybody. <laughs> Rick, thank you so much for everything. My pleasure. Network's coverage of the 65th annual AEA International Convention and Trade Show, live from New Orleans, is brought to you in part by the following sponsors. Ladies and gentlemen, may I please have your attention?